In this video, we're going to talk about some simple applications of hash tables. To begin with, we're going to do something that has absolutely nothing to do with hash tables, and that is we're going to talk about how you could determine if an array has duplicates. One way to do this is to take the array, start at the second element, and then you're going to search every element before it and check it as the same. After you've done that, you advance this element you're checking and then check is that similar to any of the elements you've seen before, and you could repeat this process. This is one way to check if something contains duplicates. It's potentially one of the first programming assignments you ever did. It involved for loops, it involved if statements, very reasonable early programming assignment. So this code is pretty bad. The worst case would be that there are no duplicates and you would compute that runtime as the sum from i equals two to n and then the sum from j equals one to i minus one of c, which is equal to the sum from i equals two to n of c times i minus one. I can write out the terms of this as c times n minus one plus c times n minus two plus all the way down until two times minus one times c. So this is equal to, that's adding up the first n minus one integers. So this is n times n minus one all over two. So it's in beta of n squared. That's not great. And in fact, you can typically expect this to take that long. The It's a bit awkward because we need to talk about how likely it is to be, that the array has duplicates, but this algorithm in general is rather slow. Hash tables are a actually better way of implementing this. So let's look at an implementation that uses hash tables and see how that compares to this rudimentary implementation that you might be able to do in something like a first year programming class. Here, we have an alternative implementation of the very same code. We are implementing this using a hash table. So to implement it, we first initialize the hash table. One way of doing this is the way we have done here, where we just declare hash table dot init, and then everywhere thereafter where we use the phrase hash table, we will assume that that refers to that hash table we have declared. An alternative way would be to actually assign this to a variable h, and then say h equals hash table dot init, and assume that we are declaring and creating the object to, to be used in the future. Now, having done that, what we're going to do is we're going to loop over the entire array and we're going to use this hash table as a way of storing the elements we have already found. So we're going to say if the hash table already contains the value that we're looking at, then that must mean we found it in the past and therefore that is a duplicate value. If the element is not in the hash table, then it must be new. So we insert that into the hash table, we add it to the hash table, and we do that with the value true. Why do we choose a value of true there? It's just a very small amount of memory. It can presumably be one bit, so we don't need to waste memory storing some other information. So let's try and understand how long does this take? We know some things about these functions. We know member and add have various complexities, but they depend on the type of hashing. If we are using chained hashing, then the expected case and the best case are in theta of one for both methods. The worst case is also in theta of n for both methods. However, the worst case for add is in theta of one. So we have this understanding. We wrote this previously as theta of one plus n over m. But if, as long as we don't have too many elements in the hash table, we can assume that that is still a constant runtime. Now, if we were to use open address hashing, there's a nice uniformity for that. The expected case and the best case are both theta of one, and the worst case was theta of n. So there's some nice similarities here. For a problem like this, we should typically make an assumption. You can either, in practice, what you can do is you can usually look up the documentation for the class that you're using, and it will likely tell you what method of hashing it is using. So here, let's assume chained hashing. So how can we do this? First, let's observe that I was actually telling a bit of a lie earlier. And that lie is, this is not quite accurate. That n there referred to the number of elements in the hash table. So 
Unfortunately, this should be a theta of I? No, that's not quite right either. It should be a theta of S, where S is the number of elements in the hash table at that point. Similarly here. Now, let's use this information. So the best case runtime and the expected case If we were trying to compute those, that for loop we can convert into a summation from i equals 1 to n of, well, in the best case and the expected case for chained hashing, the methods take theta of one time. So both of these take constant time. So this would be c plus c, which is just equal to 2cn. So this is in theta of n. Even if it never returns, it's still in theta of n, which is a marked improvement from our example we looked at before. Now, let's try and analyze the worst case, and this is where things get a little weird. Because for the worst case, suddenly we need to concern ourselves with the size of the hash table. Let's ignore that for now and write down with s in the problem and then see if we can understand what's happening. So, this would be the sum from i equals 1 to n. Member takes time proportional to the size so that we'll get a C times S for the call to member. We have no clue how S relates to I yet, but that is what it is. S will be the number of elements on that iteration. Plus C because we are also doing an add operation. Notice that if we're doing the worst case, we always are making both of those calls. We must always determine if AI is a member, even if we don't go into the if statement, we still need to compute that value in order to determine whether or not we do enter that if statement. So the worst case here is that we run through the entire loop. And in that worst case, we are going to make a call to both member and a call to add. So here's our expression for our runtime, but we have this S lingering in the problem and it's not obvious how we deal with that. So let's go back to the code and figure out how the number of elements changes. On the first run of the loop, there will be one element in the hash table because we're going to be adding it. So s equals one at the start. And then we're going to keep adding one element every time if we're assuming this is the worst case where we're going to run through this entire loop. So this value of s is actually the same as i because at each run of the loop, we are adding one new value to it. So we can actually replace s in this expression with i. So this is equal to the sum from i equals 1 to n of ci plus c. This is equal to, I can distribute that summation. The first summation would be c times n times n plus 1 over 2. That's an arithmetic summation. Plus the sum of a constant is cn. And that is hopefully clearly in theta of n squared. So our worst case is the same as our naive implementation. So this is no worse than our other implementation but it is better in the best and expected case. So this seems like we made some noticeable improvements here over the previous implementation that we had. Having said that, this is not a pure victory because we've ignored one detail which is hiding in this code, which is that we must reserve memory for this hash table. When we initialize it and we're, when we're adding things to it, we are creating more memory. So while we may have had some gains in the best and expected case, those did not come entirely free. We do need to potentially increase the amount of memory that we are using in this problem. So this is not a pure increase in efficiency. It is an increase in the runtime at a cost of a minor adjustment in the spatial complexity.